wrong or right. I think he just had the mentality that he has to win. This committee will not stop until we uncover the full truth behind the collapse of FTX. Sue, Mark. Are you in? I'm in. I'm in. We're in. Will this be the last of its kind? No. This is the nature of capitalism. Get over it. Bloomberg Surveillance covers the latest in global markets and the political events that influence your world. Join Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Abramowitz, and Anne-Marie Hordern every weekday morning at 6 a.m. Eastern, only on Bloomberg. This is special coverage of the New Hampshire primary on Bloomberg TV and radio to our audiences around the world. Alongside Kaylee Lines, I'm Joe Matthew. Polls are now closed across the Granite State as voters take part in the first primary of the 2024 election season. Former President Trump riding a wave of support after cruising to victory in the Iowa caucuses just last week and pulling in endorsements now from some of his former opponents, including South Carolina Senator Tim Scott, who recently withdrew along with former candidate Ron DeSantis. And former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley has put money and time into New Hampshire in her efforts to win the nomination. The Super PAC supporting her spending $23.5 million in the state, compared with one-third of that from the Trump-connected Super PAC. In the daily tracking poll from Suffolk University, the last one dropping this morning, Trump has extended his lead over Haley since Iowa at 60 to 38 percent. But as the saying goes, the people of Iowa pick corn, while the people of New Hampshire pick presidents. And perhaps New Hampshire has, perhaps, Joe, New Hampshire has made that pick yeah. already. The Associated Press is now calling this race Trump wins the New Hampshire Republican Party. They called it, Joe, at 8.01. Yeah, not a huge shocker. We certainly had folks expecting an 8.01 call. The AP agreed to wait for all the polls to be closed, but they've been counting votes for an hour now from polls that closed at 7 p.m. here, Kaylee Lines, and we can make uh, that clear now. The Associated Press has already called the primary for Donald Trump. It brings us to some of the same questions we were already asking, though, Kaylee. While this is a huge headline, certainly for the Trump campaign, what is turnout going to end up looking like? It looks pretty darn massive from what we've been hearing so far today, which could play well for Nikki Haley, and then to that end, what is she going to look like in the so-called strong second that Chris Sununu described to us right here? Yeah, that's absolutely right. The margin is critical here, and the margin is what we do not know at this that's point. Right. According to the Associated Press, only 17% of votes have been counted at this point. Trump has 54% of them. Nikki Haley, 45%. That is a nine-point spread, but we have a lot of votes mm -hmm. that still uh, need to be counted, and it may actually be that margin at the end of the day that decides the trajectory of the Haley campaign move, moving forward. If she decides to actually, as she said she would leading up to today, take this to her home state of South Carolina in just yeah. four weeks. And she's got some time, to your point, before uh, that contest. It's interesting. We're going to be watching areas like uh, the town we're in, Manchester, this evening to see how that plays for Nikki Haley. Some of the more affluent communities along the seacoast are going to play into this. And as we start to count votes in the more conservative, uh, essentially Boston border towns mm -hmm. along the, the or sub suburbs, rather, along the border, this could take shape in some different ways tonight. And, of course, we will be tracking it fully over the course of the next two hours on Bloomberg Television and Radio. We're live until 10 p.m. Eastern time, and we'll be joined, as always, by our political panel. They are with us now, Rick Davis, partner at Stone Court Capital, and Jeannie Shanzano, political science professor at Iona University. So, Rick, just to begin with you, perhaps it is not all too surprising, given the polling we were seeing, that Trump, according to the Associated Press, has won in New Hampshire. I guess no upset to be had this time around. Yeah, very unlikely. As you say, lots of votes to be counted, but AP has a really good model. They they rarely are wrong. And so calling the race for Donald Trump uh, pretty much puts a cap on it. As you say, um, the uh, margin uh, between uh, Trump and Nikki Haley has been expanding over time since the Iowa caucuses. No question, Donald Trump got a bump coming out of Iowa. Nikki Haley had a hard time breaking through uh, a lot of endorsements and even the Ron DeSantis uh, 
uh, withdrawal from the race and simultaneous endorsement to Trump, these all dominated the headlines here. These were what we were talking about all week. Yep. Very little about what was happening in the Nikki Haley campaign. So it's starting to show. I, I would say it's interesting that uh, when we do report this, this is a uh, state where towns matter. You know, there are 260 uh, small towns and cities, and that's where the votes are coming from. So unlike Iowa, where we were reporting on like county by county yes. tallies, yep. tonight this is a, uh, a uniqueness of uh, New Hampshire. We'll be talking about towns. We can add another headline here, and it might not come as a surprise as well from uh, uh, NBC News that, that President Biden wins the Democratic primary. We'll wait for other networks to chime in on that, but there's a big question about margin on both sides here, Kaylee. You brought this up for Donald Trump, and I'll ask you, Jeannie, to weigh in on this. As a Democrat, are you looking at New Hampshire as as the end game for the Republican nomination? Or could there be more gas in the tank for Nikki Haley? I think you guys are both right. It really depends on the margin. So, you know, this was never a question of whether Donald Trump was going to win. We have known that because there's been so much polling that has gone on here. But the question was the margin. And the thinking is, if she can keep it to the single digits, you know, in my mind, six, seven, eight percent, that is something that she can talk about as the governor has said as a win. So that margin is critical, but we should give it to Donald Trump. He is the first person in modern history mm. to break the spell <laughs> that has been a non-incumbent winning Iowa and New Hampshire. First time it's happened. And so that is a big deal. And so he has, you know, once again, broken the mold on the Republican yeah. side. So he really is running as an incumbent. Well, that's what we've been hearing yeah. consistently for all intents and purposes. This is the incumbent Republican yeah. that we are talking about. To Jeannie's point uh, about Trump here and this idea that he broke the spell, he was able to do this two states in a row, is anyone, meaning specifically Nikki Haley or even Biden ultimately in a general election, going to be able to break the Trump spell, spell when he has had such consistent bases of support. Yeah, look, I think uh, two different things, right? Uh, uh, in a primary against a, a generally considered incumbent, I mean, it's been 100 years since we had a president skip a term and run again, oh, right? Yeah, right? And Teddy Roosevelt didn't make it the second time around, but maybe Donald Trump will. Uh, but it's very hard to unseat somebody who's generally seen as been the leader of the party since 2016, unabated, right? There's been no challenge to his primacy during that period of time. So for Nikki Haley to come out of the blue and they actually get it into a one-on-one -on -one race is impressive on its own. Whether she can continue that fight and accumulate delegates and see how the rest of the year progresses for Donald Trump, because it's certainly not without its landmines for him, right? He's got 91 indictments. He's got court cases that are ongoing. Some convictions may follow, some may not. Uh, Supreme Court is opining on his immunity. And at all the same time, he's got to go down to South Carolina and potentially defend mm -hmm. uh, his title as the head of the Republican Party. So I think there's a lot to be done there. It is way too soon to make any conclusions about what November will look like because right now uh, Donald Trump actually has to contest his primary. He had to go to Iowa. He had to come to New Hampshire. And, and, and the president did not. He is not here in New Hampshire. He did not go to Iowa. He'll show up for the primary in South Carolina for the first time uh, in about a month. But uh, he doesn't have a challenge to his primacy as the leader of his party. Mm -hmm. And so he's had a bit of a luxury. Some believe he's spent some capital there and didn't do enough. But the bottom line is uh, he's had more time to prepare. And he has a war chest of over $100 million in the tank ready to go uh, when it times to contest whoever the nominee is looking tonight more and more like it might be Donald Trump. If you're just joining us on our special global coverage here from the New Hampshire primary on Bloomberg TV and radio, the Associated Press has called the race for former President Donald Trump. This is, of course, the second, only the second race in the contest. And Jeannie, people are talking about inevitability. What's your thought on moral victory here, symbolic victory for Nikki Haley? I think Rick mentioned earlier five, six point spread is something that she could spin into potential momentum. How about you? Yeah, you know, I, I think that is right. And, and let's face it, she won to a certain extent already. This is now a one on one. None of the other fellas, as she likes to call it, you know, made it that far. So that is a victory for Nikki Haley. She could push this through, but it is going to be an uphill battle. South Carolina looks nothing like New Hampshire, and this was her best state. If she loses it, 
and it looks like, well, she's already lost it, but if she loses in double digits, that is that is a really, really tough thing to come back from. Yeah. And I think to the world audience, we should be noteworthy of the fact 2024, over 140 elections around the world, the United States being watched as the leading democracy in the world, and the idea that we may be looking at another Donald Trump nomination as the Republican nominee after he refuses to accept the 2020 elections, has 91 indictments against him. This is something that is a sign to the rest of the world about democratic decline in the greatest democracy or the oldest democracy in the world. That is a big, big statement. And New Hampshire was really the big place where Nikki Haley could have made a stand. Well, very good here. We're going to have uh, Rick and Jeannie with us for the evening because we have a lot more to learn. To Rick's point, we're going to get granular, start looking at towns and really explore the votes as they come in. We're only at, what, 17 percent here. and We'll keep you posted throughout the evening with Rick Davis and Jeannie Shanzano here on Balance of Power on Bloomberg. Coming up, Christopher Galderi is going to join us, political scientist from St. Anselm College on the ground here in New Hampshire. This is special coverage of the New Hampshire primary on Bloomberg TV and radio. So let's go inside the boardroom. Let's suppose you, you win a proxy fight and or you just get invited onto the board. You go to your first board meeting and you're the person who's saying you can fix this company and all of the others on the board of directors are saying, well, we're doing pretty well. How do you get received when you start saying, here's what I wanted you to do? Well, first of all, we don't bring that to the boardroom. Our time is spent with the CEO, the chairman, the CFO, and share our plans with them outside the boardroom. We try never to solve an issue in a boardroom. Okay, it's always be best done the day before, the week before, outside that room. We wouldn't be there if they really were doing well. So it's really hard for them to straight face and tell us we're doing well. Uh, and we present them with a plan. He's playing back. We can't talk about these supporters and these voters in New Hampshire without talking about independents, which make up such a large vote share here in New Hampshire, the largest at 39%. What should we be watching for on election night when it comes to independent voters? So the turnout um, for the independents will, will be important. In 2016, President Trump benefited by independents voting here. Um, regular, you know, hardcore Republicans, you know, tended uh, to look at Donald Trump as kind of the outsider. And independents, undeclared voters, flocked to Donald Trump in 16. This year, it appears that more of them could be shifting to Nikki Haley. So if that turnout is very high on the, the undeclareds, then it could be a better night for Nikki Haley than people expect. That was New Hampshire Republican Party Chair Chris Ager speaking here in New Hampshire with Bloomberg's Tyler Kendall ahead of the primary that has already been now called for Donald Trump. Let's bring in Christopher Galdieri, political science professor at St. Anselm University, for his take. You've been in the middle of this watching the candidates uh, do their thing for weeks and months in New Hampshire. It is great to see you in person on this primary night. An early call here for Donald Trump. We still have questions, though, about turnout. 
which could set a record from early indicators. Is that possible? It is possible. Um, it seems like turnout amongst those independent voters that Haley was counting on, amongst Democrats writing in the president's name, uh, was a lot higher than anybody was expecting. Hmm. With that said, it's supposed to benefit Nikki Haley. So what kind of margins are we looking for here? That's a big. That's the big question. Um, if you look at a lot of the polling that's come out over the last week, Trump has been leading Haley by margins of 15, 20, 25 points. Mm -hmm. And so far, he's not putting up that kind of margin, which strikes me um, as a really interesting indicator. It suggests that maybe there are a lot of Republicans, uh, even though he's winning the primary, even though he's in a commanding position to get nominated, mm -hmm. who aren't 100 percent on board with that yet. Hmm. Well, right now, according to the Associated Press, roughly a fifth of votes have been counted 20 percent. Trump currently at 52.7 percent. Nikki Haley at 46.4. So again, a narrower margin than we yep. maybe expected given the polling uh, coming into today. The fact remains, though, and as Tyler just pointed out there in that interview, New Hampshire is so unique when it comes to how many undeclared voters there are. You can't replicate that anywhere else to the same extent. So if, if they can't get it over the finish line here, realistically, what is the V for Nikki Haley going forward as she weighs after tonight, having not won New Hampshire, what she should if she should mm -hmm. move forward in this campaign. Right. The problem she's facing is, you know, the next state is her home state of South Carolina. Usually your home state is in the bag for you. Polls show Trump mm -hmm. up by huge margins there. That said, it might be that the uh, margin tonight is enough encouragement for her to want to give that a go, to think that, well, if I could close it from 20-some points to six, seven, eight points in New Hampshire, maybe I can do the same thing in the state where I was governor twice. Mm -hmm. Amazing. I don't know. Um, what does it say about New Hampshire, in a state that, of course, voted for Donald Trump going back to 2016. He had to work for it, though, uh, and made very few visits to the state uh, compared to the other candidates, never spent the night here again. Certainly wasn't out door knocking. Or have the rules for the New Hampshire primary changed? I don't know if the rules for the primary have changed so much as that the rules don't seem to apply to Donald Trump. So he's the exception. He's the exception, but he's also running as a de facto incumbent president. You know, this looks his campaign looks a lot more like what you see when an incumbent president is running for re-election. Um, that said. If we treat him that way in terms of his campaign, maybe we should be thinking about him that way in terms of this result. What would we be saying if Joe Biden was up over Dean Phillips 53 to 47 mm -hmm. at this point in the evening? I think we'd be having a really different conversation. How about that? Well, to that exact point, according to the Associated Press, <laughs> in the Democratic primary, <laughs> unprocessed write in 73% of the vote, Dean Phillips 20.3%, and the Associated Press has called as of 8.07 p.m. The race in New Hampshire for Joe Biden, even though, to your point, he wasn't actually competing the race to nowhere. in New Hampshire. Right, and there, there, were no, and there are no delegates at stake. I was going to say, no delegates up for grabs in the Democratic case. In Nikki Haley's, though, she could still get delegates. That's the way the rules work right. in New Hampshire. It's delegate math at the end of the day as well. That's true. Um, now, New Hampshire does not have a lot of delegates compared 22. to bigger yeah. states like you know Texas, California, Florida, and that sort of thing. Um, I think one of the things the Haley campaign is going to have to be asking themselves is, is there a way forward where they can try to you know maximize their delegate hall, even if they don't have the sorts of fundraising they would have expected to get if they had won the primary here, um, and that sort of thing. Uh, but it's it's you know that that's a really difficult path mm -hmm. for, for a candidate who's now 0 for 2, and a couple weeks ago was talking about beating Trump in New Hampshire. Sure. Well, we just got a statement from the Trump campaign calling on Nikki Haley to drop out, uh, and that shouldn't be a big shocker. He's already called on everyone in the field to drop <laughs> out. But it reads, every day she stays in this race is another day she delivers to the Harris-Biden campaign. It's time for unity. It's time to drop out. What kind of pressure will she be feeling first thing tomorrow morning? That That's unknown at this point. Um, I, I think, you know, I don't know what's going on inside the Haley campaign. That statement strikes me as really unusual, though. Hmm. Usually candidates are pretty hands-off and gentle with uh, rivals who yeah. should drop out based on the results <laughs> so far, but they but want there to Trump. be good feelings. But this is Trump, right? He just wants to dominate his opponents and have them surrender to him the way we saw Ron DeSantis do over the weekend. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, you know, it seems like the sort of thing that could be counterproductive and lead Haley to say, okay, how do I, how do I stay in this race a little longer? Stick. Well, it was remarkable after his 
historic victory in Iowa when, when Trump took the stage at his victory party, walked up to the podium and, and congratulated both Ron DeSantis and Nikki Haley essentially on, on their efforts. It, it was very disciplined, and I wonder if we'll see that uh, repeated when I'm assuming we eventually hear from him later on this evening. Something else we've heard consistently about the Trump campaign this time around is, is that discipline, the idea that they actually are much more organized this time uh, than perhaps in his, his campaigns in the past. And part of that discipline was on, on messaging the ads that he had running in this market and in the greater Boston area on Social Security, raising the retirement age, on border policy. For any viewer that is watching this around the world right now, seeing that Trump uh, has won a second contest and and very likely could be the nominee. I do wonder how they think about those policies. We do, though, want to go to Nikki Haley because she now is speaking in New Hampshire. So let's just take a listen briefly to her words after this was called for Donald Trump. What a great night. God is so good all the time. Thank you, New Hampshire, for the love, the kindness, the support, and a great night here tonight. Thank you so much. I want to first say thank you to my husband, who I know is watching right now. I love you. We're excited to have you. I want to thank my kids who are here, Rita and Naylan and Josh, who have really kind of stepped up and um, just given me the support I need. You know, you, you really pull on your family when something like this happens, and um, I am incredibly blessed by their support. I have my parents at home, and I will always say that the way they raised me to know that we lived in the best country in the world, but to also know that the best way you appreciate your blessings is to give back. Thank you, Mom and Dad. I love you so much. <laughs> to my siblings, to my in-laws, um, to everybody back at home, to Vicki for helping me take care of Mom and Dad. Thank you for that. You know, I will tell you, it has been, it feels like it's been a lifetime, but it has been almost a year that we've been campaigning in New Hampshire, touching every hand, um, answering every question, being the last person to leave. And we had um, the most amazing thing happen is the second that we got the endorsement from Governor Chris Sununu. <laughs> I mean, a true governor that doesn't stand behind a podium. He shows up at a diner. He shows up at the brewery. He loves the people of New Hampshire. He has been with me every single day at every single event. Chris, I couldn't have done it without you. And I want to thank someone who was with me on day one. He's a patriot. He's a hardcore conservative, and he is my friend, General Don Baldick and Sharon. Thank you so, so much. I want to congratulate Donald Trump on his victory tonight. He earned it, and I want to acknowledge that. Now, you've all heard the chatter among the political class. They're falling all over themselves, saying this race is over. It's not over. Well, I have news for all of them. New Hampshire is first in the nation. It is not the last in the nation. This race is far from over. There are dozens of states left to go. And the next one is my sweet state of South Carolina. At one point in this campaign, there were 14 of us running. And we were at 2% in the polls. Well, I'm a fighter. 
and I'm scrappy. And now we're the last one standing next to Donald Trump. And today we got close to half of the vote. We still have a ways to go, but we keep moving up. For a lot of people, politics is way too personal. It's not personal for me. I voted for Trump twice. I was proud to serve America in his cabinet. I agree with many of his policies. I decided to run because I'm worried about the future of our country and because it's time to put the negativity and chaos behind us. We have an economy that's crushing middle-class Americans. We have a border that is totally open and dangerous, creating a disaster in our country. Unbelievable! We have school... We have schools that are failing too many of our children, and we have a world on fire with a war in Europe and the Middle East and a huge and growing threat from China. And then you look at Washington, D.C. We have a Congress that fights about everything and accomplishes nothing. And we have Joe Biden in the White House making one bad decision after another, when he's making any decisions at all. Our country's in a real mess. is, who's going to fix it? With Donald Trump, Republicans have lost almost every competitive election. We lost the Senate. We lost the House. We lost the White House. We lost in 2018. We lost in 2020. And we lost in 2022. The worst kept secret in politics is how badly the Democrats want to run against Donald Trump. Yes. Yes. Trump's a loser. He's a loser. They know Trump is the only Republican in the country who Joe Biden can defeat. You can't fix you can't fix the mess if you don't win an election. You want to win. A Trump nomination is a Biden win and a Kamala Harris presidency. I defeat Biden handily. We want you, Nikki. With Donald Trump. You have one bout of chaos after another. This court case, that controversy, this tweet, that senior moment. You can't fix Joe Biden's chaos with Republican chaos. The other day, Donald Trump accused me of not providing security at the Capitol on January 6th. Now, I've long called for mental competency tests for politicians over the age of 75. <laughs> Trump claims he'd do better than me in one of those tests. Maybe he would, maybe he wouldn't. But if he thinks that, then he should have no problem standing on a debate stage with me. Most 
Americans do not want a rematch between Biden and Trump. No. The first party to retire its 80-year-old candidate is going to be the party that wins this election. <laughs> should be the Republicans that win this election. So our fight is not over, because we have a country to save. In the, in the next two months, millions of voters in over 20 states will have their say. We should honor them and allow them to vote. And guess what? In the next two months, Joe Biden isn't going to get any younger or any better. <laughs> we'll have all the time we need to defeat Joe Biden. <laughs> when we get to South Carolina, Donald Trump's going to have a harder time falsely attacking me. The great people of South Carolina know I cut their taxes. They know. They know I signed the toughest illegal immigration bill in the country. They know we passed voter ID and tort reform. And Former and U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley speaking this evening after the primary race here in New Hampshire was called for her opponent, Donald Trump. Nikki Haley conceding that Trump was the victor here in New Hampshire, but signaling she is not getting out of this race. She says New Hampshire is the first in the nation. It is not the last in the nation going on to say the race is far from over. There are dozens of states left to go. And the next one is my sweet state of South Carolina. Let's get reaction now to Nikki Haley's words. Joining us around the table are Bloomberg's Mike Shepard and Wendy Benjaminson. So Wendy, just to begin with you, she calls it her sweet state of South Carolina. She signals she is taking this there on February 24th, potentially even beyond. And yet in South Carolina, she is pulling farther behind the former president than she was here That's right. in New Hampshire. How steep is this hill for her to climb after tonight? It's a very steep hill for her to climb after tonight, going to South Carolina. And it will be bittersweet, I think, because it is her home state. It is where she was the governor. She was popular there. But Trump is so much more vastly popular among that very religious, very conservative cohort of Republican primary voters in South Carolina. Now, her super PAC today did say that they were planning to take her funding through South Carolina and beyond if it's she she did well, but I'm afraid that might be good money, throwing good money after bad because of Trump's popularity in a state like that. There's a major uh, funding meeting, a donor meeting coming up January 30. Uh, Druck and Miller, a lot of big names, as Bloomberg has reported. I'm assuming that meeting stays on the calendar. Michael, are they scrutinizing? The potential spread here, the margin, the way political scientists are? Well, her allies have said all along, including Governor Chris Sununu, during the interview that you and Kaylee conducted with him over the weekend, and we've heard this in our own reporting uh, with some of the groups that are backing her, that New Hampshire was not a must win, mm. that she had to keep it close to be able to sustain that credibility with donors and to be able to sustain that sense of hope among her supporters and eventual voters in the later states. Mm -hmm. As you heard the uh, ambassador say during her remarks just now, this is a momentum play, and they are trying to show that they have been gaining steadily. Now, whether that carries into South Carolina, where Wendy just outlined you know, a pretty steep hill to climb and a big gap in polling to close, yeah. it's going to be tough for donors and voters alike. Mm -hmm. Although I will say on, on the gap in polling, the poll we got, the latest Suffolk University poll as of this morning had Trump 20 two points ahead, and granted, we only have about a quarter of votes counted at this point, but according to the Associated Press, he's at 52.9, she's at 46.2. We're talking a much narrower spread than expected. So I guess it becomes a question of if the race is actually potentially this tight once all of the votes come in, doesn't that show that it isn't just half of the Republican Party supporting Trump, but roughly half of the reporting Republican Party who is not, and especially as we get closer to, say, the start of criminal trials that could happen in March, the day before Super Tuesday. 
I wonder if, if that picture begins to change. Well, one of the questions we've seen is this whole legal shadow that is hanging over Trump. And will that really affect his voters and start to change their minds? And what we've seen in poll after poll is that no. And in fact, for some of them, they actually uh, are frustrated and annoyed and motivated by this. It's not a signature issue from them, but they do identify so strongly with the former president that this helps to rally them to their to, uh, to his side. Well, let's carry that ball a little bit further. Kaylee, you're you know pointing ahead to what could be a very difficult year for Donald Trump, mm -hmm. uh, balancing the courtroom and the stump. What's the strategy then here for Nikki Haley to try to drag this out? If we're not going to be banking wins in the early states, is it to get just enough delegates to stay alive and push this as close to the convention as you can in case there is a legal problem for the former president? Yes, something like that. I mean, I think that she very much wants to stay in the race in case he trips up, in case something happens like a criminal conviction or a civil case that's, you know, the E. Jean Carroll case going on, the fraud case yeah. in New York. There are a lot of these. In um, that case, she never needs to win a state. You just scoop up a couple of delegates with each one as you go. Right. The trouble is that among Republican primary voters, not the general electorate who are sympathetic to her arguments mm -hmm. is that the Republican primary voters believe Donald Trump that all of these cases, all of these prosecutions are entirely Democratic fiction witch hunts. And so the more he gets in trouble there, the better he's doing with Republican primary voters across the country. Mm -hmm. Now, if it were later, if in the general election, if this happens, you know, there, there will be Democrats and independents who don't like Joe Biden, who might be leaning toward another candidate who would look at an alternative. Yeah. But in the primary, the, the trials are not really hurting him. Mm -hmm. Well, as we talk about what galvanizes Trump's base or just the Republican voter, sure, we have seen his legal trials and tribulations have that effect. But also, I, I think it's fair to say, Mike, we have seen here in New Hampshire, as we did in Iowa, that it's the economy, which we all knew, <laughs> could have guessed in every election cycle, probably for, for all of history. But it's also the border, perhaps even more so the border. What what have we been hearing from voters here in New Hampshire, and is it reflective of what we're hearing everywhere else? Well, Kelly, you, Wendy, Joe, and I, we've all gone out to some of these voter events and meetings that the candidates have had with, you know, potential supporters. Every single person that we've talked to mentioned the economy, but then they said, but now the border. And this was true today when I went to a polling place uh, not too far from here in Manchester, and the border Order came up with each Trump supporter that I spoke to, people who said that they had voted for Barack Obama in 2008, in 2012, but then went to Trump in 2016 and haven't looked back. And each of them said they are really worried about the situation that they're seeing on the southern frontier with Mexico. Hmm. Great conversation with Wendy Benjaminson and Mike Shepard. Bloomberg's best with us here in Manchester, New Hampshire tonight, when we're going to have a lot more for you in our global special coverage from the first in the nation primary called already for former President Donald Trump. Right now, we want to get a quick check on the markets in Asia. And joining us now, Bloomberg's David Inglis. Hi, David. Hi. Uh, good morning, guys. So it's just gone uh, past 9.30 uh, in the morning here in Hong Kong. So we're just a couple of minutes into the open across markets here in Hong Kong and up in greater China, up in the mainland China. And we are getting a day two uh, of gains across these equity markets. Arguably, day two is really the acid test whether we are going to get some consistency in these gains uh, following the initial pop uh, that we got on Tuesday. Uh, we, we're tracking several things across these Chinese markets. Uh, you have, of course, the big tech plays, which did see substantial gains in the U.S. session. So, Bob, but it's down to the New York Times story. And Billy Billy, 4.7% uh, to the upside right now. HS Tech Index is up 3%. Uh, a couple of things to note here in China. Xinhua reporting, just uh, just getting this out there, the securities regulator is reminding the public they'll be cracking down on unusual trading and price manipulation. The Securities Daily separate report front page, more importantly, uh, discussing the crucial role that state-backed funds and what we're seeing today will be playing to stabilize these markets. And so far, day two, we're doing quite well. There's a PBOC briefing, by the way, just to get that out there as well later today. Flip the boards, please. Uh, some of these China proxies, iron ore, for example, you have the Aussie dollar, uh, still very much in focusing a little bit of uh, weakness, although if you measure that over 48 hours or so, substantially higher. 
Uh, we are moving closer to that event horizon. That is the ECB meeting coming up. That's Thursday evening, of course, in, well, Asia time. Uh, the euro is seeing some stability uh, following what's, what's really uh, about a weakness overnight. Ten-year yield effectively trading at the highs in about seven weeks or so. And very quickly, just a glance at the state of markets across the region and, of course, U.S. futures as well. So we are... All things equal, on the benchmark, we're up for a fifth straight day. Volumes are there. Most sectors are higher. And U.S. futures on that note now have a 4,900 handle on that note. I'll send it back to you guys in the U.S. All right, Bloomberg's David Inglace, thank you so much. Now coming up, we'll continue our special coverage of the New Hampshire primary from here in Manchester, simulcast globally. This is Bloomberg TV and radio. has enhanced search on the terminal to deliver what you need when you need it. Now, you can simply type phrases in everyday English in the command line. Compare financials. Find people. Analyze markets. You can enter phrases or ask questions. What do you want to know today? Ask a question or visit SearchGo to find answers now. what he says he's going to do. He fixed the economy. We had cheaper gas, cheaper food. Everything was better. And this is, it's just ridiculous now. So the economy is huge for me. Also immigration. I think that's my number one topic, my one issue that needs to be addressed is immigration. That was Trump supporter Lynn Marino speaking to Bloomberg earlier this week here in New Hampshire, where, of course, he has been declared the victor of the first in the nation primary. Let's go now to Gail Huff Brown, who is with us on set here in Manchester, live on Bloomberg Television and Radio. She's a former New Hampshire candidate for Congress. Great to see you. Thank you so much for coming in on, on an evening in which we maybe aren't surprised by, by the end results. But... It was interesting to hear Nikki Haley just moments ago say, yes, I recognize Trump won here, but this race is not over. Many more states ahead, including her home state of South Carolina. Meanwhile, the former president is writing on True Social. Haley said she had to win in New Hampshire. She didn't. Delusional. <laughs> Is she delusional to no. believe if she couldn't pull it off here, she could pull it off somewhere else? I don't think she's delusional. I think that that's how politics goes. I mean, basically, you have to say that if she plans to stay in it, then, you know, that that is exactly where she's going to go with it. But here's the biggest problem. New Hampshire is where the investors, those who are going to donate, the big donors, are making their determinations. Mm -hmm. And they see now that maybe the writing's on the wall, and um, it's the donors that are going to start falling off. And that's exactly what happened with Ron DeSantis. I mean, he ultimately had to get out of the race because he was losing the donors. And, and that, unfortunately, is the first step. And that's what happens after you come in a second or third or further down in New Hampshire. Well, that's interesting. You sound like this might be over then, and, and, and that's important because you hosted all of the candidates all in your them. home. We yes. spoke with your husband, Scott yep. Brown, about this last yep. night. You actually knew at one point that there was a field. Everyone parachuted into New Hampshire when it was basically down to two. What is it about New Hampshire then 
and Donald Trump that has galvanized his support on such a level for you to call the game so early tonight? Well, yeah, people are just very, very nostalgic, and they are very eager for yesteryear, you know, when the inflation wasn't so high, when the interest rate wasn't so high, when they weren't going to the grocery store and spending, you know, so much more money on eggs and butter and cheese and bread. And uh, it, people just weren't spending the kind of money that they are now. And we didn't have the conflicts we had around the world. Now, one of the big issues here in New Hampshire is, of course, the border. And people are very upset about what's happening there with millions of people coming over the border. You don't have to look far to find somebody or know somebody who died from a fentanyl overdose here. And those drugs are coming up through the country, up here to New Hampshire, and people want the border closed. And they believe, Donald Trump, that he can close the border. And that's a major factor for a lot of Granite Staters. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess it, it is a question on border security, and we know that the, the current president sitting in the White House also knows that as he is trying to work out a border security deal with, with Congress at the moment. On that note uh, of President Biden, we did get a statement in from the Biden campaign, which says, while we work toward November 2024, one thing is increasingly clear today. Donald Trump is headed straight into a general election matchup where he'll face the only person to have ever beaten him at the ballot box, Joe well, Biden. Joe Biden. Biden and all of his people want Donald Trump to be the Republican nominee. That's exactly what they want. So tonight he is the winner. Joe Biden is the winner because. So you think Biden still could beat Trump despite what we're seeing in polling in swing, yeah. swing states and elsewhere? Do I think he could? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that voters have to look at this very realistically and know that uh, the country is very divided. We're a divided country with a lot of angry people out there. Uh, which way it turns, I mean, obviously, I, I, I wish I had a crystal ball, uh, and I don't, but I think that it's going to be a very competitive race. But clearly, people are looking for change. And uh, I think there is a lot of disappointment and more disappointment tonight knowing that that this is going to be a Trump and Biden matchup yeah. once again. So where are we on a third party then? Because No Labels is looking at New Hampshire, or at least it has been, having Joe Manchin visit and other potential candidates who Democrats say would spoil this race and hand it to Donald Trump. Could you see New Hampshire voters embracing an idea of a third party right now? New Hampshire voters are pretty loyal to Donald Trump. Hmm. I think, um, you know, you're seeing that tonight. Republican voters. But without, of yeah. course, of course, I'm talking about Republican voters, of course. Um, so I, it's so, so They don't hard. split for a third party. No, <laughs> they don't. They don't. I, it would be shocking to me mm -hmm. if, uh, if that ever happened. Well, I'm, I'm just continually looking at the Associated Press. 27% now mm -hmm. of votes counted. 53.4% for Donald Trump. 45.7% for Nikki Haley. So we're talking less than an eight-point spread here. Did, did Nikki Haley and Chris Sununu, the governor here by extension, set the bar too low potentially? Could have potentially led voters leading into today to think, well, she doesn't think she could win anyway. I, don't, I guess it's hopeless and I'm not... I'm not going to go cast a vote for her if Trump's got this in the bag. I don't think so. I think, honestly, that um, she ran a really, really aggressive campaign here in New Hampshire. Um, and Chris Sununu, a very popular governor, was up on the high hills and low valleys shouting her praises. He was uh, out there every day, it seemed, uh, at a rally, at a diner, uh, you know, spouting about how she had a chance and not to listen to the polls. and. Um, Unfortunately, I, once again, I think that uh, New Hampshire just sided with someone that they felt could bring them back to something that they, they like, which is lower interest rates and better prices and lower gas prices and, um, you know, uh, lesser conflicts around the world. Yeah. I'm glad that you could come talk to us. Thank you. We have a lot to learn still tonight, Kaylee, and we should remind everyone that while this race has been called, we still have to understand the contours mm -hmm. of uh, not only the margins, but turnout.
Yeah. It was supposed to be a record. Absolutely. That is what the Secretary of State said leading up to today and actually in an interview this evening said he stands by that we could see record turnout here. His estimate had been 322,000 maybe a little while before we actually have those numbers firmly in hand. But of course, we'll bring them to you when we do. Gail Huff Brown, former New Hampshire candidate for Congress, thank you so much for joining us this evening. We really appreciate, appreciate your time and we have much more coming up. We'll be joined once again by our political panel with special coverage of the New Hampshire primary on Bloomberg Television and Radio. studios in New York and San Francisco. Our expert hosts have the data and analysis about the companies you know and the startups to watch, plus the interviews you don't want to miss. Watch Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow on Bloomberg Technology, the only daily business show dedicated to tech right in the middle of the trading action. 11 a.m. on the East Coast, 8 a.m. in the West, only on Bloomberg Television. Context changes everything. Why do the biggest names in business choose Bloomberg? That is a great question. It's a great question. Great question. Great question. The best question I get all night. Bloomberg. Top experts. Great questions. Now you've all heard the chatter among the political class. They're falling all over themselves saying this race is over. Well, I have news for all of them. New Hampshire is first in the nation. It is not the last in the nation. This race is far from over. There are dozens of states left to go. Nikki Haley speaking a short time ago after not winning the New Hampshire primary, though she called it a great day, saying that our country's in a real mess. The question is, who's going to fix it? Helping us answer that question, our political panel, back with us here on Global Special Coverage from Manchester, New Hampshire, Rick Davis, partner at Stone Court Capital, and Ginny Shansano, political science professor at Iona University, with us as we speak to a global audience this evening. Rick, the significance of what has happened. You were with us when the news first broke here. This is going to come down to a conversation uh, of margins apparently and money because she says she's not leaving the race. Yeah, the margins are getting wider. The question is, is the money going to get smaller? Mm. Uh, she's got a big fundraiser plan in New York in two weeks. Uh, can that fuel enough of her campaign to keep going into South Carolina? She's made a $4 million buy already on South Carolina Airwaves, seven different media yeah. markets there. It's not insignificant. Uh, but you've also heard her allude to the chattering class tonight, John Cornyn, a holdout from Trump, the Texas Republican in leadership in the United States Senate has endorsed Donald Trump, says we got to unite behind a single candidate. And in this case, it happens to be Donald Trump. So she's going to be facing a lot of headwinds from what is now the establishment of the party. And the question is, can she crack that open in South Carolina? Well, and it's not just members of Congress. It's also say, a governor in Florida who was a candidate up until a few days ago. Governor DeSantis dropped out of this race, endorsed Trump immediately, as had Vivek Ramaswamy on the night of the caucus in Iowa, and as had many others, including Doug Burgum as well. Jeannie, is that ultimately a real factor here? Is the endorsements, the idea that everybody is, is falling in line, or does this really come down to 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 policy differences between Trump and Haley and and just the firm support of his base, which has been true 
long before anyone else was even in this race. Yeah, you know, I, I think, you know, she had a, she faces a really tough issue because the endorsements do matter because, as Rick was talking about, we are seeing them. Cornyn, Barrasso, they are just, the next few days, it's a brutal four weeks to South Carolina. And so does she keep fighting this out? You know, it's not as if all candidates decide to suspend their campaign, but the money could dry out as people see no path forward. And you look at the demographics of South Carolina, hard to imagine a path forward. It's also really tough to spin two back-to-back -back losses. And that's what she's had, a really rough third place in Iowa, coming here a rough second place. We still don't know the margin. But that said, I think we should also talk about the flip side, which is that we have essentially an incumbent president in Donald Trump who has only gotten 50 percent in the first two states, Iowa and New Hampshire. That is awful for an incumbent. And we should look at it from that perspective because he does not have the widespread support. And so she's right when he, she says he can have difficulty winning this election. You know, an incumbent should be getting seven, eight, nine out of 10 in these caucuses and, and primaries. He's 50 percent. So that is not a good number for him. And her campaign knows that. What do you make of the Donald Trump statement in our uh, remaining moment here, Rick, urging her to get out of the race now? His supporters, of course, are going to be echoing that with the strength of an incumbent, as we've been discussing. How does she put that off for four more weeks? Yeah, no, I think it's a pretty good shot across the bow that Donald Trump gave her tonight, because if she doesn't get out, she will face the most brutal assault yes. on her campaign in South Carolina that you'll ever see. Hmm. All of MAGA will descend upon that state and they will brook nothing for her in this regard. So we've already seen how he plays and he plays hardball yeah. and in South Carolina it's a blood sport to begin with. You've and been there. That'll be a difficult matchup. Rick Davis and Jeannie Shanzano are sticking with us here in special global coverage live from Manchester, New Hampshire. We'll have much more ahead on Bloomberg TV and radio back at the top of the hour. So stay with us. The shape of the On Athletic shoe is unique. It can't be mistaken for any other brand. The structure of On's C-suite is just as distinctive, starting at the top with a pair of CEOs. What we realized very early on is if you're adding different capabilities to each other and, and you do that as equals, then this leads to, to better outcomes. Mark Maurer joined On as Chief Operating Officer in March 2013. Martin Hoffman arrived as CFO that July. In 2021, they jointly assumed the CEO role. We are a brand that needs to be excellent in, in designing product, in innovating product, but also in shipping millions of parcels from A to B in the most efficient way. So we need to have very different mindsets and, and very diverse people. Mark has different strengths. I have different strengths. Um, and if you take us together, you just get more. Companies with co-CEOs are rare, but ON's configuration is even more unusual. Martin Hoffman also holds the CFO position. He says his two jobs complement each other. I actually feel the CFO makes you a better CEO and the CEO makes you a better CFO. Understanding what you build as a CEO helps you to understand your numbers and understanding the numbers helps you what are the right things to build. 
think this will probably go down in history as one of, if not the largest financial crime ever. I cannot imagine a scenario where $8 billion just disappears. Bankman Freed has pled not guilty to multiple fraud charges. Sam was just too important in the crypto community. When someone says, I'm going to give a billion dollars in the next two years, like that catches everybody's attention. As time went on, their ideas got like weirder and weirder. I don't think he even had almost a conception at some point that it was wrong or right. I think he just had the mentality that he has to win. This committee will not stop until we uncover the full truth behind the collapse of FTX. Sue, Mark. Are you in? I'm in. I'm in? We're in. Will this be the last of its kind? No. This is the nature of capitalism. Get over it. In a multi-trillion dollar industry, there's a lot of ground to cover. We indeed have a rally. We're talking a lot of dividends. We're talking income. We'll show you what's happening in ETFs like no one else. Bloomberg ETF IQ, Monday on Bloomberg. Welcome back to special coverage of the New Hampshire Republican primary on Bloomberg TV and radio. The race has been called. Donald Trump has won. And just moments ago, we heard from the runner-up, Nikki Haley, conceding here in the Granite State. I want to congratulate Donald Trump on his victory tonight. He earned it, and I want to acknowledge that. And back with us now, our political panel, Rick Davis, partner at Stone Court Capital, is here alongside Jeannie Shanzano, political science professor at Iona University. Rick, what are we looking at the rest of the night here? Because we do still have some questions to answer, as we said earlier, particularly when it comes to margin. We're just past, what, a third of the way here, Kaylee, as we look at the numbers of precincts reporting. There's a lot of votes still to come in. Yeah, I mean, every indication is it may actually exceed the Secretary of State's prediction of 322,000 yeah. uh, voters. So uh, a healthy uh, and robust uh, day at the polls for New Hampshire voters. Well done. Uh, this is what we come to New Hampshire to do, is see a real democracy in action. Uh, and I think that you're going to see more and more votes coming from the rural areas. Uh, right now, it's inside a 10-point range mm -hmm. uh, between Donald Trump and Nikki Haley. And I think all you're going to do is see more and more margin coming in from Donald, for Donald Trump voters. You know, these are his strongholds, uh, rural voters. Uh, and, 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 and one of the things we're seeing, which is a very stark contrast, which we've seen in Iowa and we've seen in the polling nationally, is Donald Trump is doing exceptionally well with voters who don't have a college education. But Nikki Haley has really racked up margins uh, with voters who do have a college education. Dartmouth, that area around Hanover, uh, she was leading Donald Trump 80% uh, hmm. uh, in a college town like that where it's very high education levels. That being said, there are more voters who don't have college education in New Hampshire than otherwise. Hmm. So on margins, right now 32% of the vote count in, according to the Associated Press, Trump 53.9, Haley 45.1. So we're just under a nine-point spread at this point. I feel like we should remind Jeannie, our global audience that's watching, that this is the second in a row that Trump has won. There's only been two contests. He has won both. In Iowa, though, historically, the person who wins does not end up the nominee. It's been that way in the last several uh, competitive contests. Ted Cruz, for example, won it in 2016 when Trump was the eventual nominee. That's not necessarily the case with New Hampshire, but is this going to be the year that Iowa and New Hampshire both picked the presidents. It wasn't just Iowa picking corn this time. Yeah, I mean, that could be. It seems like that's what we are looking at. And, you know, this is, once again, I have to say, Donald Trump breaking these established molds. I think he has changed this Republican Party. And let's, you know, not forget, he has changed the primary process as well. Here, as we sit in New Hampshire, you had Nikki Haley crossing this state end-to-end, -end, back and 
and forth, campaign events and rallies and all these kinds of things. He was dropping in for one event a day in between court cases for his 91 felony indictments, and yet he has led this thing. And so I think it's incumbent on all of us to try to understand what it is that voters on the Republican side are seeing in Donald Trump that they find attractive. And I have to say, give him credit, he ran a really smart campaign here. The two issues he focused on, immigration, security broadly, but immigration, Social Security, Medicare, which we keep saying Joe Matthew was in his commercial on that. <laughs> and those two things, he tried to move voters, and it seems like they were effective. And it's something to keep in mind. We talk a lot about Donald Trump saying things out of turn, talking about people calling them names. Right. He was issue focused, at least on the air here. For our TV audience, we're seeing a live view of votes being counted uh, right now in New Hampshire with uh, quite a few to go here. Rick, the psychology behind Nikki Haley's decision here, knowing that she is trailing Donald Trump badly in her home state, as she moves closer to South Carolina, could she be more likely to drop out to avoid embarrassment there, or is she committed to that contest? You know, look, this is a gut check, right? Um, she's uh, been under attack by Donald Trump pretty significantly since the Iowa caucus. She's withstood that pretty well. Uh, she did fall into a bit of a routine here of responding to all the attacks, which is exactly what you don't want to do when you're taking in that kind of assault. Uh, and the question she's going to have, the gut check is, do I want to go through four weeks of just intense barrage of attacks by the MAGA machine in South Carolina, a significant force of politics that can really hurt her image long term wow. if she's not careful. Uh, and, and, and that's going to be really the core question. I don't think South Carolina is going to be determined by money. She'll have plenty of money mm -hmm. to fuel a South Carolina came for four, campaign for four weeks. The question is, is she going to want to? Huh. Well, you talk about the attacks that she could be on the receiving end of. There also is the question of the attacks she could be dealing out. We saw in the very final days leading up to here in New Hampshire a sharpening of the knife, if you will, mm -hmm. going after Trump for things, as we heard her speaking this evening, things like senior moments when he confused her apparently with Nancy Pelosi, uh, thinking she may have been at the Capitol on January 6th when he was speaking a few days ago. He's, she's called him chaotic. If she's going to do this... Over the course of the next four weeks, how much harder realistically should she go and, and will she? I know a lot of her advisors have been wanting to ramp up the attacks, just like you were talking about, not just on mental competency and age. Uh, you know, that, that's that been sort of the core. And that at the end of the day, she still says, yeah, but he's fit to be president, right? Mm -hmm. At some point, I think you have to draw a brighter and stronger contrast. You have to say, you know, he, and, and the electability issue has been one that I think she's starting to play even harder. She, tonight, she said, he can't beat Biden. And she's the only one who can. In fact, she said any other Republican could, but that means her. So uh, I think that she's going to have to come out much more aggressively. There's no way a massive negative campaign against you is, is going to be successful for you unless you are able to mount a significant and very well-scripted targeted campaign against your opponent. And, and she didn't do it, and, and DeSantis didn't do it, and, and the only one who really tried that was Christie, but he didn't attack Donald Trump on the issues. He attacked Donald Trump on his personality. She's got to hone an issues attack and prove to voters in South Carolina that his form of government is not conservative and not good for the country. Wow. Jeannie, the Biden campaign is already mobilizing here like it's over. The statement uh, from Joe Biden's campaign, one thing is clear, Donald Trump is headed straight into a general election matchup where he will face the only person to have ever beaten him at the ballot box, Joe Biden. Is it right? Is this general election underway? You know, and this is one of the things we heard Nikki Haley say tonight, that Republicans should be concerned that Democrats want to run against Donald Trump. And that is something we've known because the Biden admin, the Biden team has said that. Um, you know, and, and I think we're hard-pressed to imagine that anybody besides Donald Trump, barring something we, you know, unexpected, is going to get this nomination. And, you know, to put a finer point on it, let's just remember, evangelicals in South South Carolina, her home state, three out of four voters identify as evangelicals, only one out of four in, Nor in New Hampshire. This is why this was the state for her to beat him. That said, she also tonight said, 
I'm going to challenge him to a debate. Why is he scared to debate me? So if she stays in this thing, she's going to be taunting him about a debate. Right. But if you're Donald Trump, not gonna happen. What, what incentives do you have to debate? She's And who is she to ask? She's lost two now. So it's, you know, if she stays in, I expect we'll hear that. But gosh, it's hard to imagine a way forward now. She really needed all New Hampshire delegates to pull this thing through to the end successfully. Well, and debates typically f feature two things, one of them being attacks against the person you're debating, the other being actual, in theory, if it's working, substantive policy conversation. And, and earlier, a few days ago over the weekend, we talked to Governor Chris Sununu, of course, endorsed Haley, actively campaigned for her here in New Hampshire, didn't result in a win for her, obviously. And I asked him, is the differentiator between Haley and Trump actually policy or your what you think is the ability to execute on that policy? And he said it's execution, not actually policy. Is that an issue here? You just aren't convincing voters that you would actually be that much different, that you have different ideas that you're talking about? You know, I, th I think it's a mistake because, you know, let's face it, voters look back at four years of Trump on the Republican side and they see successes there. Um, you know, so I think it's very hard to convince them that the execution wasn't there. But there are policy differentials and she started talking about them and then she dropped back a bit. And I think that that has been a problem. You know, there there are many, many Republicans who you look at the amount of spending mm -hmm. under the Trump administration who find that objectionable. But she had to hit him hard, as did Ron DeSantis. Not having done that already, I'm not convinced she can make that case now as she Uh, does she have to win her home state? Is it as simple as that? Well, you can't win a nomination by coming in second. Yeah. And that's really <laughs> what she's something. been doing. And, and uh, the political graveyards are stacked full of candidates who thought they could win by coming in second, and they never did. Uh, I mean, this will be the first time uh, that a candidate could have actually won the first three uh, primaries and caucuses. Uh, and then, you know, it's, we've never turned back a nominee from that, ever. And so, the, as Jeannie likes to say, Donald Trump likes to break the mold, and <laughs> she would have to really break a big mold to be successful this way. That being said, you know, a lot of people are talking about this notion of hanging around the hoop long enough, keep racking up delegates, yes. and stay in the race, and keep raising money, and be in the fly in the ointment for Donald Trump. At which point, maybe he does get convicted of one of these uh, crimes. Maybe he has enough of these uh, mental moments to uh, convince even his own voters that he doesn't have a path to go forward to beat Joe Biden. And then she's there with the electability argument, and it sounds pretty good at that point. Yeah, I guess none of us can know for sure what's going to happen over the course of the five months between now and when the sure. Republican convention actually takes place in July. And of course, Rick and Jeannie will be here to walk us through the next several months, just like they are sticking with us for the remainder of this hour. Rick and Jeannie will be back with us. But coming up, we're going to turn to foreign policy, something that Nikki Haley also has staked her candidacy on is her reputation in that arena. We'll be joined by Elena Lyon of the University of New Hampshire coming up next. This is special coverage of the New Hampshire primary on Bloomberg Television and Radio.
CFOs are reshaping the C-suite. Bloomberg's chief future officer shines a spotlight on these dynamic leaders. Today's CFO has to be much, much more than a bookkeeper. One of the most important things is looking around the corner. We have to let go of the traditional legacy department store. Their impact goes far beyond the balance sheet. And on chief future officer, they focus on much more than just revenues and margins. You also have to be credible business leaders in order to really impact the business and steer the direction. We are like biologists. We need to deeply understand the financial DNA of a company. People just come with a playbook and say, okay, we're gonna roll that. Don't do that. Think longer term. It's an amazing time to be in this role. It's a lot more than the profit today. It's building the future of tomorrow. Get passion, perspective, and more from the chief future officers of some of the world's most influential companies. A new episode every month, only on Bloomberg. He doesn't believe in limited government. He believes in this kind of dictatorship. He doesn't believe in local control. He believes in Washington. So those are not Republican values. But you have said because he, if he were to be the Republican nominee and because you are a Republican, yeah. you would support Yeah, him. I think most people would. That shouldn't surprise anybody. Even though you don't think he actually carries the values of the Republican party? Well, it, look, Joe Biden, that's how bad Joe Biden is. That was part of our conversation with New Hampshire Governor Chris Sununu earlier this week in Manchester as he was a surrogate for Nikki Haley, endorsed her, campaigned heavily for her here in this Granite State, and yet that was not enough to actually lead to a victory for her here in New Hampshire. The race was called just over an hour ago for Donald Trump. Right now, 34% of votes are counted. He has 53.4% to Nikki Haley's 45%. 0.6%. The question is the trajectory of Haley's candidacy going forward and also how much this will become more about the issues at play here. We want to talk about foreign policy issues in particular now. Let's go to Elena Lyons. She's political science professor at the University of New Hampshire and author of U.S. Politics and the United Nations. She is joining us here live in our Manchester studios as we simulcast you globally on both Bloomberg Television and radio. Professor Lyon, thank you so much for joining us this evening. We were just having a conversation with our colleagues Rick and Jeannie about issues domestically, the border, Social Security and Medicare, the retirement age. Nikki Haley is the former ambassador of the United Nations. And at a time where you have a conflict in the Middle East, you have a conflict uh, ongoing in Ukraine, she has really tried to flex that, at least to this point. Is it resonating with voters, or do these issues just come too far below some of the other domestic problems that it's not enough to, to propel a candidacy like hers forward? Yeah, uh, such a great question. So there's actually a recent AP poll out looking at exactly this and asked voters, what are your top five issues? And foreign policy made the top five, not the top, but the top five. For I think it was 46% of Republicans, which actually doubled that from prior. And it's a little lower, like 37% or so for Democrats. So yes, I think that foreign policy is incredibly important. Uh, maybe not the kitchen table issues that people tend to think of, but the news is full of uh, a lot of instability in the Middle East. And you know, every time you open up your phone, there's something about the Middle East, whether it's Iran or Israel or the Houthis or uh, the situation in Ukraine. So I think people are paying attention, and, and it seems so volatile. They're nervous. We have a global audience tonight, as Kaylee mentioned. To what extent is the world watching this primary? Joe Biden always tells the story about his first. G7 when he said America's back and the reply was for how long? Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I, the rest of the world, whether or not it's Vladimir Putin or the Europeans or the Canadian prime minister, mm -hmm. everyone is watching. And the United States is relevant to, we have boots on the ground or military presence in over 125 countries. Mm -hmm. We are a leader of what we call the international order, right? We were the architects of the United Nations, of NATO, yeah. of the IMF, of the World Bank, of the G7. The United States has led for over seven 
70 years and provided guidance to deal with many of these issues. And there's a lot of concern during the Trump administration. There was a concerted pullback, right? Trump was America first, sure. not about dealing with global stability. And so there's a lot of people looking at the volatile issues around the world saying, is there someone that's going to come help us think this through and work these problems? Well, and you certainly got a taste of that at the World Economic Forum in Davos last week, where, where world leaders, specifically European ones, even a central banker, ECB President Christine Lagarde, were talking about how they view the risk of another Trump presidency, how Europe has, uh, has to think about that. You say that this is an issue that is, that is resonating with voters, that they care about foreign policy issues. And the fact of the matter remains that at least judging by the tally right now and looking back at Iowa, hmm. more than 50 percent of Republican voters support the former president who did have an isolationist bent, who did threaten potentially to leave NATO. Does that show that actually it's not just about him, but the American electorate is becoming more isolationist. Yeah, you know, and it's funny, isolationism is a term that academics actually fight over. Are we isolationist? Do we really want to? And, and I think that many aren't quite sure, one, what isolationism means and whether or not it's even possible, right? Mm -hmm. When we think about isolationism, we think about the early 1900s, right? When you could actually kind of close borders and you didn't have planes coming in. I mean, the our economy, the United States economy, relies on our interactions with the world. Our health, as we learned from COVID, relies on our interactions with the world. Yeah our climate health, if you will, you know, if we're talking about climate change, the United States can't do it alone. There's absolutely no. So there, I think that the notion of isolationism is, is a really old, old one. And I think that there's a lot of fear in the electorate. Like, we don't know what's going on out there. And the, the, ins the instinct is to kind of retract, yeah. right? And especially, uh, you know, there's war fatigue. The, the fatigue of Afghanistan and of Iraq was real. Uh, electorate really felt that we wrote a lot of checks and didn't get a lot back. But in terms of being isolationist, I don't even know if it's possible. It's great rhetoric. Mm -hmm. We're showing live pictures uh, to our TV audience of an empty podium waiting for Donald Trump, and we'll have remarks from him uh, when he does emerge here, having had this race called very early on uh, for Donald Trump here. The Associated Press waited one minute until after the polls closed to get this done. We had news today, Kaylee, of an eighth strike, an eighth U.S. strike against Houthi rebels mm -hmm. in Yemen. You mentioned this steady drip of frankly scary headlines that people are hearing and reading about in the news. To what extent will Joe Biden be judged as having a steady hand on the tiller versus what some people see as international chaos? Yeah, no, I think that's exactly right. I think that, you know, we're in the middle of a storm, right? a squall, if you were using New Hampshire terms here, at the global level, particularly in the Middle East. There are seven to eight uh, particular conflicts going on within the Middle East. I mean, I'm trying to count them and map them out and explain it's them to my hard, students. It? it is. Yeah. It is very complicated. And, you know, they've got these little fires. It is a tinderbox. If you have volatility in Washington, D.C., a tweet, or, a, or something to that particular effect could be, you know, I had former students who worked at the State Department and they said, you know, they'd wake up in the morning, they would have their marching orders, they would be preparing to do this, to work with this particular country and yeah. push it forward, and then all of a sudden a tweet would change everything. And so that level of volatility is very concerning. Yeah, yeah and we certainly have seen the former president, though he's no longer on Twitter, posting on X this evening after his victory here in New Hampshire, saying Nikki Haley is delusional, that she got in third in Iowa uh, as she was... At at her uh, victory party talking about how she did concede this race but was going to move forward to her home state of South Carolina. She said New Hampshire was the first in the nation. It is not the last in the nation. She's going <laughs> to carry this forward. And, and we are seeing pictures now for our TV audience of Donald Trump uh, at his, his party this evening as well. We expect, Joe, that we'll hear from him very shortly. Yeah, he's got the whole family with him, or at least a number of uh, family on the stage with a, a, a long bank of American flags and the typical Trump setup. A lot of phones in the air here, Kaylee, as we wait to hear remarks from uh, the former president. I'm curious which Trump we get, if it's retribution Trump or if it's come together unity Trump. We've seen both in the last week. Yes, we absolutely have. After Iowa, very congratulatory tone even for yeah. Ron DeSantis and Nikki Haley for the campaigns they were running there. Much more disciplined message. We'll wait to see uh, how what kind of tone he strikes this evening. Yep. Professor Lyon, just one more question quickly, and I apologize if I'll have to interrupt you when, when the former president starts to speak. You were talking about your students and also explaining to them the issues of the Middle East. And we have seen that students, the younger 
population here in the United States has at least a group of them very particular feeling about what's happening right now in Gaza, the conflict between Israel and Hamas. How much is that dragging on the incumbent president, Joe Biden, his handling of that issue in particular, as we have seen tens of thousands of civilians killed? Yeah, I think it's going to be a significant issue for whoever becomes president. And it's definitely something that Biden's had to tread very carefully. One, we have been unconditional allies of Israel for years and years. And, and, and where how, how unconditional is that? But also being mindful of the fact that there are 22 Arab states and there is yes. Iran and there is Turkey. And we are we are close to those countries as well. We're going to hear from the former president. Of course. He's speaking live <laughs> at his... Victory rally in Nashua, New Hampshire. If you're watching on TV, you see Senator Tim Scott Fantastic. behind him. Let's listen live on Bloomberg. This is a great, great state. You know, we won New Hampshire three times now, three. We, we win it every time. We win the primary, we win the generals. We've won it, and it's a very, very special place to me. It's very important. If you remember in 2016, we came here and we needed that win, and we won by 21 points, and it was great. And uh, today, I have to tell you, it was very interesting because I said, wow, what a great victory. But then somebody ran up to the stage all dressed up nicely <laughs> when it was at 7. But now I just walked up and it's at 14. But, but she ran up when it was 7. And, you know, we have to do what's good for our party. And she was up, and I said, wow, she's doing uh, like a speech like she won. She didn't win. She lost. And, you know, last, last week, we had a little bit of a problem. And if you remember, Ron was very upset because she ran up and she pretended she won Iowa. <laughs> and I looked around. I said, didn't she come in third? Yeah, she came in third. And then I looked at the polls. She was talking about most winnability, who's going to win. And I had one put up. I don't know if you see it, but I have one put up. We've won almost every single poll in the last three months against crooked Joe Biden. Almost every poll. And she doesn't win those polls. And she doesn't win those. This is not your typical victory speech, but let's not have somebody take a victory when she had a very bad night. She had a very bad night. And you, uh, you have the, you have the very, the now very unpopular governor of this state. This guy, he's got to be on something. I've never seen anybody with energy. He's like uh, hopscotch. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm watching this guy. And two weeks ago, he said, "We're going to win. We're going to win in the landslide. We're going to win." About three days ago, he started saying, "Well, we want to do well." That's a big difference. But I walked out just now, we're 14 points up, and I don't know what it's going to be. But when she was up here, it was like six or seven. And, you know, with like 7% of the vote counted. Now, uh, let, let me just tell you, we, uh, we had an unbelievable week last week in Iowa. We set a record. It was the best in the history of the caucus, in the history. And uh, I remember I sort of had the same feeling. I'm up and I'm watching, and I said, she's taking a victory lap. And we, we beat her so badly, she was, but Ron beat her also. You know, Ron came in second and he left. She came in third and she's still hanging around. The other thing, she only got 25% of the Republican votes. I don't know if you saw that. Tremendous numbers of independents came out because in this state, because you have a governor that doesn't, frankly, know what the hell he's doing in this state. In the Republican primary, they accept Democrats to vote. In fact, I think they had 4,000 Democrats, Democrats before October 6th. They already voted. Now, they're only voting because they want to make me look as bad as possible. Because if you remember, we won in 2016. And if you really remember, and if you want to play it straight, we also won in 2020. By more. And we did much better in 2020 than we did in 2016. But as they said, we lost by a whisker, just by a whisker. No, no, no. But we can't let that happen. You know, you have to have people that speak up. I said, I can go up and I can say to everybody, oh, thank you for the victory. It's wonderful. It's what or I can go up and say, who the hell was the imposter that went up on the stage before? 
and like claimed a victory. She did very poorly, actually. She had to win. The governor said, she's gonna win, she's gonna win, she's gonna win. Then she, she failed badly. Now I have here, if he promises to do, to do it in a minute or less, but the only person more angry than, let's say me, but I don't get too angry, I get even. The only person, The only per because he was there, and he did fantastically well, by the way, and then he endorsed me. And we don't have to talk about Tim Scott, who, by the way, just got engaged, we have to tell you. And that's more important than all of this stuff. But a man that got to know her very well is Vivek. I said, Vivek. I said, Vivek. Go up and say a few words about it. He has to do it in one minute or less, and then we're going to just say, we had one hell of a night tonight. And one other thing before Vivek comes, do you see that, Paul? We're going to put it up. We have beaten Biden. You could almost say, who can't? Who the hell can't? The man can't put two sentences together. He can't find the stairs off a stage. Who can't? But. Vivek, one minute or less. Go do it, Vivek. What we saw tonight. Donald Trump speaking live in Nashua, New Hampshire, as he hands the microphone over to Vivek Ramaswamy, uh, talking, uh, obviously, about his victory here in New Hampshire, criticizing Nikki Haley at length and repeating debunked claims about winning the 2020 election. Kaylee, I guess that is what we would get. There was a bit of a misunderstanding there at one point, whether he was talking about the general election mm -hmm. or this New Hampshire primary, which I think Nikki Haley would have called a senior moment. But sometimes it's not always easy to tell where we're going in these ad-lib speeches. Well, that's right. Nikki Haley's speech earlier today certainly was was not as off the cuff as this one that's seemed right. to be. This speech that Trump is just gave less discipline, perhaps, than the one he gave after his victory in Iowa. But when you listen to some of the things he said, that Haley had a very bad night tonight, that she was wow. acting like it was a victory speech when, in fact, she didn't win. He said Ron came in second and he left. She came in third, referring to Iowa, and she's still hanging around. But that is indeed what Haley seems to have suggested this evening. No, she did not win in New Hampshire, but there are other contests ahead and she yep. intends to compete in them. She says she's not leaving this race as some thought she might if she didn't win here in New Hampshire, having put a lot of eggs in this basket. Joining us now, Bloomberg's Peggy Collins and Mario Parker with us at the table. Now that we have a better sense of where we're going here, uh, Mario, y you covered Donald Trump. Uh, in the White House and as a candidate. How difficult, how bruising is this going to be for the next four weeks if she decides to stay in this race? Well, Joe and Kaylee, you all set it up perfectly. I mean, what you saw in that speech that he just gave was he was signaling that it's going to be rough now. He's about to probably start throwing some really, really tough haymakers, especially as he goes towards South Carolina. Look, the former president is under legal troubles. He wants to make this a coronation more than a nomination. He needs these victories. He needed this New Hampshire victory. He needed Iowa. He's going to need South Carolina. She's signaling that she's going to stay in the race until South Carolina at least. So you're going to see things get pretty ugly. Well, and South Carolina is still four weeks away. That primary, Peggy, is on, on February 24th. We have a global audience joining us here on TV and radio tonight. Would anyone listening to us right now have any real reason to believe that Trump wasn't ultimately going to be the nominee, regardless of whether or not Nikki Haley decides to continue uh, competing in these contests or not. Right now, looking at the data, he pulled more than 50 percent of the vote here, as he did in Iowa last week. Well, I think the momentum is clearly going his way. That's undeniable. But I think what people have said around the Haley campaign, even in the days leading up to this, is that they wanted to show that they are doing better with each race. So they did do that tonight. They had a better showing than in Iowa. So the question is going to be, in her home state, can she perform even better than she did here in Iowa? So now we're getting into, as Mario said, kind of the zone of the 50 percent and whether or not she can show that 
that she's going to be able to compete with Donald Trump before he gets that coronation and nomination slam dunk in some ways. The question worth asking again, though, Mario, is how she can do it there if not here in New Hampshire, knowing it's going to be a lot closer to Iowa politics in terms of demographics and values in South Carolina. I believe Jeannie mentioned one in four Republicans are evangelicals. That's Trump country again, is it not? That's a great point, Joe. I mean, you saw Nikki Haley's campaign. Also, you saw Americans for Prosperity. Mm -hmm. Other groups really go all in in New Hampshire. This was her best shot right now, just given the, di the, the composition of the electorate, highly educated, uh, white collar, suburbans, yeah. moderate uh, voters as well, uh, undecided voters. And then you go to South Carolina, and it looks a lot like Iowa. She's hoping that she has a little bit of home court advantage there. Yes, sure. But again, this is a deeply red state in South Carolina. It is it's very also famous. got a history of some pretty dirty tricks. That is true, absolutely. And then you've got Donald Trump down there. He's had this infrastructure. Again, I think one of the things that we forget about in this election is the fact that Donald Trump is running for a third time. The muscle memory that you get, the infrastructure that you, infrastructure that you have over that course as well, able to kind of sow the ground in some of these key states. Well, and that's what we've been hearing about his campaign this third time around, that it is much more organized, that they are much more disciplined. Uh, and perhaps we are seeing the reaped reward of that in New Hampshire this evening. We're talking about South Carolina in terms of the Republican primary, Peggy, but there will also be a Democratic Party in South Carolina. Officially, if we're talking about what counts in terms of delegates, it will be the first for the Democratic Party. Joe Biden was not on the ballot here in the Granite State this evening. There was a write-in campaign. It appears he won that by uh, a pretty sizable margin. Dean Phillips, though, a congressman from Minnesota, a Democrat, got 20 percent of the vote. How should we be thinking about what New Hampshire tells us about the incumbent president as he is the presumptive Democratic nominee at this point? Well, I certainly think we saw in talking to voters and then tonight in some of the results that there are a lot of people who are saying they're not seeing what they want to see coming out of the Biden administration and their campaign. We saw time and time again that people were telling us immigration and border security have become almost as big as, if not a bigger issue, than how much people are seeing their pocketbooks get hurt by inflation, which was the big issue last year. So I certainly think that people are looking to the president and not only asking questions about age, but asking questions about policy. And so the Biden campaign is really going to have to answer those questions to voters heading into South Carolina, as you said, Haley. Uh, uh, as you said, Kaylee, I'm sorry, <laughs> um, in terms of how they are going to solve some of these problems that Americans are saying, hey, we see this as a problem, we want a solution for it. Yeah. Mario, you had a fascinating interview that you brought us at Bloomberg with Larry Hogan. When his, he was still a national co-chair of No Labels, he's since left that group, which got everyone thinking he might launch a run for the presidency. They have said if it's Trump, Biden, by Super Tuesday, we're running a candidate, whether it's Larry Hogan or someone else. Will that happen? It looks like it, right? Because that's what's happening. At least we're, at least as of today, it looks like we're going forth toward this this rematch of Biden and Trump. Uh, something that voters, our polling shows that voters have no appetite for. Yeah. So it does look like the No Labels movement will be moving forward, at least if they're, they're going to keep their word in that regard. All right. Bloomberg's Mario Parker, who leads our White House and national politics coverage here at Bloomberg, as well as Peggy Collins, our Washington bureau chief. Thank you both so much for joining us this evening, not from Washington, but from Manchester, New Hampshire, where Trump has been declared the victor of the first in the nation primary. We want to go now, though, across the world to our colleague, David Inglis, who is taking a look at our bread and butter here at Bloomberg, the markets in Asia. Hey, David. <laughs> Hey, yeah, so we're about, uh, about an hour into the, the, the session uh, in these Chinese markets. And yeah, I mean, all the center of gravity really, as you can see here, is really with these benchmarks. Day two of gains in Hong Kong mostly. And as you can see, the CSI 300, which is the, uh, the mainland Chinese benchmark, is seeing some weakness right now. Commentary coming through, despite the volumes coming through, is, you know, a lot of this is still short covering. Certainly with authorities maybe providing a floor to this market does give more reason to cover those shorts out there. What's interesting as well is the fear gauge in Hong Kong has stopped dropping today, which may signal, I guess, doubts among some traders that this rally has a long way to go. Although, if you do look at local media commentary, the messaging is fairly consistent out of Chinese media in support uh, of the stock market today. Let's flip the boards and still a China story, different asset class. Uh, this is still playing out as well, this risk rally across Chinese listed commodities. And a lot of this comes down to the fact that you have industrial metals, for example, and very large 
like positioning going into uh, the mid part of last week. Now, that being said, I just note data out of uh, our colleagues at Bloomberg, uh, new economic finance, energy finance rather, that this rally in iron ore might actually not last. When you look at real activity numbers, there's a, there's a place called Tangshan that's in China, that's, steel, that's a steel making hub. Activity there, blast furnaces, is actually now at a pandemic, post pandemic low. So I just get juxtaposing the, uh, the, the rally we're seeing in markets against underlying data. Uh, very quickly, Flip the boards. The rest of the region, including what we're doing as far as U.S. futures are concerned here. There we go, 4,900 in that. The rest of the region outside China, uninspired. Back to you guys. Our thanks to Bloomberg's David Inglis for helping us out. As part of our global special coverage from New Hampshire ahead, we'll be joined by Jen Nassour, former chair of the Massachusetts Republican Party, and her view on a contest called early tonight for Donald Trump. This is special coverage of the New Hampshire primary on Bloomberg TV and radio. for news and analysis covering the biggest challenges facing the UK government, economy, financial services and markets. Tax cuts should not be the priority. It's about a credible plan for growth over the next two, three years. In this post-Brexit world, how do you see actually servicing your clients? It was disruptive and it's going to have implications to how capital raising works. Now we're having the perfect storm in the UK. Watch Francine Lacqua Thursdays at 9.30 a.m. only on Bloomberg. Context changes everything. Special global coverage of the New Hampshire primary here on Bloomberg TV and radio. We thank you for joining us as we turn now to Bloomberg's Tyler Kendall reporting live here in the midst of vote counting in New Hampshire. Hi, Tyler. Hey, Joe. So as we are watching these results start to roll in, we at Bloomberg here are still focused on the margin for the independent voter. As we've been talking about all night, this is an open primary, which meant that registered Republicans and those registered as undeclared could participate. Independent voters make up the largest share of the New Hampshire electorate at 39 percent. So when we're talking about these margins, these are the voters that Nikki Haley really had been targeting and will continue to target. But it's important to remember that back in 20. 2016, then candidate Trump handedly won the independent vote in both the primary and the general for New Hampshire. So these were really his voters to lose. Now, Joe, I have been here on the ground talking to these voters, searching for the elusive independent voter. Take a listen to what some of them told me about why they were coming out tonight. New Hampshire voters are serious. They explore their candidates, they research. Um, I think New Hampshire has a great opportunity to show the rest of the country what all our research has brought. I think New Hampshire has the most involved voters of any state in the union. Um, I don't think there's anyone who votes in this state who doesn't have an opinion on something. Now, part of why this race was called so early tonight was because the early returns that we were starting to get in showed that Nikki Haley was really only beating former President Trump in the more Democratic-leaning cities like the capital of Concord. So, Joe, these more suburban bellwether towns that I know you and me were watching for, uh, the Haley campaign was not doing as well as they thought they would, according to those early returns. Now, Joe and Kaylee, as we've been talking about all night, next up is South Carolina. That's also an open primary, which means that we are going to be talking about these independent voters again. 
Yes, we absolutely will. Our thanks to Bloomberg's Tyler Kendall here in Manchester. Talking about the margin on independence, just a quick look at the margin overall right now. According to the Associated Press, almost half of votes have been counted at this point, 43 percent. Donald Trump with 53.1 percent, Nikki Haley with 45.8. So right now the margin is of less than eight percentage points. Let's bring in now Jen Nassour, Jennifer Nassour. She is former chair of the Massachusetts Republican Party who is joining us remotely this evening. Jennifer, thank you so much for being with us. We thought coming into today that the margin could be double digits, perhaps something like 20 if the polls were correct. Right now the margin is, is less than eight points. Is this enough for Nikki Haley to move forward? It absolutely is. Listen, at the end of the day, the only thing the campaign wanted to do was continue to march up from Iowa to New Hampshire to South Carolina and on to Super Tuesday. And so what we have tonight is a tremendous amount of excitement. There's a whole room way behind me of people who are smiling and happy and excited for what has to come next. Listen, Nikki Haley is the only person out of this two-person race who can beat Joe Biden. Nikki Haley is the only person out of the three of them that has a vision for the future, a positive vision for the future. And on all accounts, she hits everything on domestic policy, on foreign policy, on national security, on education. And she's an accountant. She wants to get the economy back on track and have a balanced budget. Everything about this woman is why independents came out today and why Republicans who feel disenfranchised from what Donald Trump has done in the past. And that's why people came out in New Hampshire tonight. Okay, Jennifer, so she's got a great story to tell. There's no doubt about it, but what's the path? If she can't get it done in New Hampshire, it doesn't look like she will in her home state of South Carolina. Where do we go from here? So here's the thing. I mean, all of you guys want to say that this thing is done. There are, what, 350 million Americans in this country. And, and out of less than 500,000 people, two states, one state that actually doesn't have a, nor a regular election process, that a historically low number of people came out. Only 100,000 people came out, and only 50,000 people voted for Donald Trump. And now in, in New Hampshire, we had historic high numbers, and Nikki Haley came very close to Donald Trump. Donald Trump thinks he's running as an incumbent president. Isn't this embarrassing? An incumbent president or someone who's running as an incumbent or someone with the name recognition that Donald Trump has should have, as Chris Christie said, by the way, smoked her. And you know what he didn't do? He didn't smoke her. As a matter of fact, Donald Trump should be embarrassed tonight. He should go home with his head between his legs. Wow. And it's interesting to hear you say that when he did win here in New Hampshire with more than 50% of the vote, it seems, while we wait for the full full tally. But I want to talk about the breakdown of the vote, the actual Democrat demographics here as well, because, of course, Nikki Haley is a woman of color. She is also, just frankly, a woman. According to AP vote cast, cast data in their exit poll, the breakdown for Trump and Haley is almost identical in terms of, of the female and male breakdown. 55% of both men and women voted for Trump. 39% of men voted for Trump. 38% of women supported Haley. Why aren't more women getting behind her, Jennifer? Well, I think, number one, you know, if we really want to have a conversation, I think that the first thing that is a problem is the voting system in America. I think that we need to change the voting process, but that's a different issue for a different day. Unlike the Democrats that just say, we're not going to actually play in the first primary in the nation. So that, that's a different conversation. Um, but I think that also, you know, there were so many candidates in this race. There were 14 candidates in this race when Nikki Haley first started. She was at 2% in Iowa and landed up with almost 20%. In, in New Hampshire, she was also in the single digits. She knocked out all of the guys, and now it's a two-person race. And so no one's giving her credit for that. And so here's what I see right now from my position as a former party chair, is that this is an insurgency against insanity. It's an insurgency against the establishment. Donald Trump has proven himself to be the establishment candidate. And Nikki Haley, once again, as she did in South Carolina, is the outsider. 
We've talked about a couple of issues here tonight. We haven't mentioned reproductive rights, the issue of abortion that looms so large in the midterms, Jennifer, and some very important state elections over the course of time since Roe v. Wade was struck down that had many thinking that we could have another issue here on the level of the economy or immigration. I don't know to what extent that moved voters here in New Hampshire, but how can Nikki Haley seize on that issue moving forward? Well, Nikki Haley is the only candidate in this race who actually wants to sit down and have a conversation. She's the only candidate in this race who actually understands women's rights. She's the only candidate in this race who, you know, is listening to her daughter, listening to her friends, and has yeah. real life experience. And so if you want to Is it time for her to be more specific, though, about policy? She's been criticized for being she, vague in reaching essentially for, for some sort of consensus that may not exist, Jennifer. How is, how is that big? You know what's really, what's really kind of oppressive in America at this point is that everyone needs to be so completely polarized. And instead of wanting to sit at a table and come to some consensus, which is what all of us do, don't we do that in our own homes, whether you're with your partner, whether you're sitting around the table with your kids and you're having a conversation, whether you're in your office and you're talking to your partners and you're talking to other people you work with, there's always consensus. But for some reason in politics, it is one way or the other way. And if you don't agree with me, then you don't agree with me. And that is not the principles that America was founded on. And if you think of Ronald Reagan, who I always botch what he said, but you know, you don't have to agree with me 100% of the time, just agree with me 80% of the time. And I think in this situation, it is having someone who wants to sit at the table, listen to all parties, take everyone's positions into account and come to some sort of consensus. 85% of Americans are somewhere on the abortion issue. They're somewhere between 13 and 20 weeks. Shouldn't we listen to the American public? But here's what's happening. We have people who are elected to office that don't want to listen to their constituency. And I think it's about time that we have someone elected to office that actually wants to listen to the American people. We appreciate your views, Jennifer. Thanks for joining us as part of our special coverage on this primary night. Jennifer Nasur, as we update the numbers here quickly and watching the results coming out of New Hampshire here with roughly half the votes counted at this point. It's Donald Trump with nearly 54 percent of the vote and Nikki Haley at 45. Coming up, we're back with our political panel, Rick and Jean, are ahead on special coverage of the New Hampshire primary on Bloomberg TV and radio. it at the touch of a button. Another volatile day on Wall Street. We're seeing big moves. All eyes on Capitol Hill as Democrats and Republicans. Prepare. Today's job numbers casting doubt on the Fed's next move. Inflation remains front and center. And that's news when you want it with Bloomberg News. Now get it 24-7 on the Bloomberg Business app, Bloomberg.com, and anywhere you get your podcasts. Bloomberg News Now. Context changes everything. Bloomberg Surveillance covers the latest in global markets and the political events that influence your world. Join Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Abramowitz, and Anne-Marie Hordern every weekday morning at 6 a.m. Eastern, only on Bloomberg. doesn't win this. This is not your typical victory speech, but let's not have somebody take a victory when she had a very bad night. She had a very bad night. 
Former President Donald Trump bit earlier this hour after winning the New Hampshire primary in early call. Back with us now, our political panel, Rick Davis, partner at Stone Court Capital, is here along with Jeannie Shanzano, political science professor at Iona University. What did you make of uh, the victory speech, of the class act that you were expecting, Jeannie? You know, if you win, you would think you would claim victory. This thing is wrapped up and yeah. graciously move on. Not Donald Trump. We heard an angry, furious Donald Trump that she is still in this thing, that she worked for him, that she has attacked him. He said falsely that he has won every New, ha New Hampshire election he has been in. He has not. He lost in 2016. He lost in 2020 in the general. I mean, this is a sign of what we are in store for as we move to South Carolina. And not just South Carolina, once he wraps this thing up. This was Donald Trump, and it's not the gracious one uh, that we saw or the you know, the sort of conciliatory one. Yeah. Yeah. That that didn't come out tonight. So he, it's it's a sign of what we're in for, I think. Well, and we'll see how much that gets ramped up over the course of the next four weeks to South Carolina. That primary on February 24th, Nikki Haley says that she will be there at least for now. Mm -hmm. But there's also a primary in South Carolina in February for the Democrats, Rick. It technically didn't begin here in New Hampshire, but it kind of did because there was a write-in campaign for President Biden. It appears that he won that with a pretty significant margin. What becomes of other candidates like the congressman from Minnesota, Dean Phillips, who were trying to compete here? Yeah, I think there's one more tombstone in the political graveyard with a new name on it, and oh, that's boy. Dean Phillips. Wow. I don't think we'll have to hear much more from him. Dean, it was great while it lasted. He had tons of energy here in New Hampshire, but he couldn't really make the protest vote that he wanted out of uh, the Biden presidency. And so move aside, the general election has begun tonight. Amazing. Wow. Which means the longest general election of our lives, which would mean the most expensive general election campaign of our lives. What does that even look like when you're six months down the road? Do these candidates need to go underwater for a while? Oh, no. They're going to start ramping it up. I mean, Republican and Democratic donors beware. Yeah. <laughs> They're about to get the their hands into your ringing. pocket. This is going to be oh. probably the most expensive presidential election in history. You have six to eight states that will be pummeled with TV advertising that technically has already started in some of these places. So you're right, Joe, this is going to be the longest presidential general election history, it, uh, in history. Amazing. It's incredible. And Jeannie, we don't know for a fact that it will ultimately be just these two Republican Democratic nominee competing yeah. in November. Come Super Tuesday, if it is just the two of them, how serious do we need to be about the idea of a third party entering the picture? I think very seriously, because this is a race that potentially, if the general election, as Rick said, begins tonight, is beginning and we are seeing two of the least popular politicians in the United States facing each other. And quite frankly, a race people don't want to live through again. Yeah. So I do think there is a chance we will see a third party candidate, whether it's no labels or somebody else come through and say, listen, this is, you know, there's got to be an alternative here because a lot of Americans don't want either Joe Biden, Biden or Donald Trump on this ballot. Yeah, here we are again talking about <laughs> that very scenario. It seems closer to reality yep. than ever, Kaylee. Remarkable experience here in New Hampshire as we now move further down the campaign trail. And our thanks to Rick Davis, partner at Stone Court Capital, and Jeannie Shanzano, political science professor at Iona University. We thank you for joining our special global coverage of the New Hampshire Republican primary. We'll have a lot more, more for you here tomorrow. This is Bloomberg TV and Radio.
women on average have about a 30% lower, um, yes. I guess, amount of money saved up for retirement compared to men. Yes. So what are you doing about that? Yeah, so we launched a campaign called Retire Inequality. Um, and we do know that women retire with 30% less. Women make 83 cents on the dollar. And so there's a couple of things that we're doing. One, it's having this conversation and making sure that we all are aware that there is a gap. By the way, women live longer than men, so longevity risk is a real factor. Secondly, it's about making sure that we are talking to women about what can you do differently. And so whether that's negotiating pay and what are some tools that are out there, making sure that you take the time to negotiate because we know women do not negotiate as much as men, which puts you at a disadvantage to start. But then also along the way, making sure that women are securing their own retirement and that as part of their retirement plan, we're having much more conversation around guaranteed income as well. And so ensuring that we understand what are the nuances for women. If you think about COVID, two million women exited the workforce. They did not con continue to contribute to their 401k or 403b plan. And so how do we make sure as a matter of policy, as a matter of engagement, that women can have an opportunity to catch up, that women can understand that if you exited the workforce and now you're back, that that's two years of compounding that you were not able to take advantage of. And how do we continue to make sure that we're educating them and giving the tools that they need to get back on track? I think this will probably go down in history as one of, if not the largest financial crime ever. I cannot imagine a scenario where $8 billion just disappears. Bankman Freed has pled not guilty to multiple fraud charges. Sam was just too important in the crypto community. When someone says, I'm gonna give a billion dollars in the next two years, like that catches everybody's attention. As time went on, their ideas got like weirder and weirder. I don't think he even had almost a conception at some point that it was wrong or right. I think he just had the mentality that he has to win. This committee will not stop until we uncover the full truth behind the collapse of FTX. Sue, so, Mark. Are you in? I'm in. I'm in. We're in. Will this be the last of its kind? No. This is the nature of capitalism. Get over it. It is almost 11 a.m. in Singapore, Shanghai. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets Asia. I'm Haslinda Amin. And I'm Yvonne Men in Hong Kong. Here are the top stories. The Hang Seng again, leading gains in Asia stock markets as investors assess Beijing's latest support plans. The Nikkei slipping, though.